Well, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. We are so excited to be able to be back in person. And it's a wonderful topic because there's so many interesting and things that need to be talked about still about the Vietnam War conflict. There was a question earlier on Facebook about why I didn't refer to it as the Vietnam War on Facebook and why we refer to it as a conflict. We refer to it as a conflict because it was never a declared war. And it's one of those things in American history that makes you ponder and wonder why was that and why and so many questions. And so tonight we're going to start on a 10 week journey where we're going to look at so many different aspects of the conflict and of the war and of Vietnam and all of those years and all of the people and all of that were involved and every aspect of it. Um, as we begin every program here at the Silver Sides, we begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you are able, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. And as I said, it is so good to be able to see people back in person and to interact back in person. The intention of our lecture is to be able to continuously do this in person as well as a Zoom link. And welcome to everyone that is on our Zoom link. And our Zoom links have grown over the course of the pandemic. And it's wonderful to see people from near and far away that have an opportunity to become one of our scholars and to understand. The USS Silverside Summary Museum's mission is simple, is to honor the veteran. And we do that through education and preservation. Any of you that walk around this museum see everything that we do to preserve things. We preserve our vessels, we preserve artifacts, and we preserve the stories. But part of that is the bigger part is it's very hard to honor something that you really don't know anything about. So the education component is key to what we do here. Not only do we give lectures on military history, of which we do about 25 of them a year, this summer we started a slightly different program that did topics that were of interest to veterans. And we covered different things like TRICARE and entrepreneurs and military entrepreneurs and veterans that had done it's wonderful things after they have left the military and used their training and their abilities afterwards to lead extraordinary lives. Our fall lecture series is going to be on Vietnam for all of you that are here. We'll be having 10 lectures on that. It'll be a little bit different than most other Vietnam history courses because we're not going to do it chronologically. We're going to do it based upon the different types of services they were offered, the different branches of the service. And so each week we'll have a different branch represented. Next week we'll be using Ron Janowski and he'll be discussing the Army's role in Vietnam and talking about what they did. So if any of you are Army veterans, please make sure that you tell all of your friends and let's have as many Army vets as we can here each week. The following week, we have the Army Nurse Corps and Connie will be talking about the role of nurses in Vietnam and how they changed and how different nursing became because of the Vietnam conflict and how the medical services that were received were so extraordinarily different during this conflict than others. Then from there, we are going to go on and highlight each of the different branches, and we hope that you'll be with us each and every night of our lecture series. We will always be here at the museum at 6 p.m., as well as on Zoom at 6 p.m. If you are interested in getting a Zoom link, just email the museum, Teresa Falkmeyer. Her email is on our website. It is also on the events page of our website, as well as on our Facebook page. Just email her directly and we will send you the links each and every week. The USS Silverside Summary Museum does not receive any state, federal, or local funding. Everything that we do here, we do this through the generosity of our community. And it is through the different ways, whether it be admissions to the museum, whether it be donations, whether it be gift shop sales. All of that counts towards making us being able to serve our mission of honoring the veteran. We have the support 
of the Fred Birch C. Jr. Foundation out of Holland. Fred and his wife both served during World War II. Fred um, was actually at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. And we oftentimes, we have his firsthand account of a letter that he wrote home at that point describing his, his experiences to his parents. And the line that always makes me stand out in all of this is, Mom, I wish more of my co-military uh, co people had been duck hunters as children because that's how low they came. And if they were all duck hunters, we could have taken out more of the Japanese at that point. It is through this and his time in the service when he returned to civilian life, both he and his wife became teachers. And then after that, they, um, Fred, C., Fred Jr. served as the principal of the Holland High School. Their society felt that, and they felt so strongly that education was so important and they wanted people to serve their community whether it be the state the federal or the local level and all of that comes from education and they are one of our wonderful sponsors for this series blue lake public radio is our media sponsor for this series and we are very grateful to them for all that they do for us and the wonderful wonderful things that they say about us Tonight is the first of our series, and they will go for 10 weeks, and it'll end up in November on, the, on Vietnam. Next week's, lecture, next week's lecture is going to be the Army in Vietnam, and I see my graphic moved up to the top of the page there, and that'll be done by Ron Janowski. And I encourage you, anyone that you know that is an Army veteran that has served in Vietnam, please let them know about this. Um, and let them know that they can come in person or that we'll gladly share the link with them. Look at that. It came to the right spot at that point. Tonight's speaker is Fred Johnson, a wonderful speaker, a veteran himself, who will set the stage for how did America end up in Vietnam? How did we become part of this? And what was so different about this conflict than the other conflicts that have been out there? And so without further ado, I will let Fred change the screen, the screen here, and then we'll have him come up and begin his lecture. If you have any questions, um, please raise your hand. If we can get to them during the lecture, we will get to them. Those of you that are on Zoom, please send me a chat, and I will answer your questions. If not, I will open up everyone's microphone so that you can ask questions at the end of the lecture. Thank you all for attending, whether it is in person or in Zoom. And without further ado, here is Fred. Good evening. I cannot tell you all how wonderful it is to be back with you face to face. Zoom is okay, but it's better to be face to face. And for our Zoom audience, Welcome to you too. I can see from the camera that I still have some weight to lose, but that we'll go ahead and get right into this. Listen, <laughs> Vietnam. Vietnam, we find that Vietnam is relevant again. With the recent pullout of Af Afghanistan, I know you all watched that and you heard the news. People were immediately comparing it to how we left Vietnam. They talked about the chaos, they talked about the equipment that was left behind. There were so many parallels about leaving Vietnam. Clearly, Vietnam is still something that is deep in the consciousness of Americans, particularly Americans who lived through that or grew up with it in that, in that era. Peg is right, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I didn't serve in Vietnam, but I grew up with that war. So it is much a part of my consciousness is for those who served there. My father did two tours in Vietnam, so I've been preoccupied with Vietnam all my life as I have studied, studied history. Peg is correct. We want to talk about how do we actually get involved in Vietnam. From any discussion of Vietnam, it seems, it seems to me that you have to talk about the legacy, the legacy of Vietnam and the lessons of Vietnam. The legacy pretty much speaks for itself, I think. And the legacy of Vietnam, we had to start off, I think, with the faces of it, faces, faces from the storm of Vietnam. This map speaks a tale all by itself. I tell my students at Hope College, if you let them, if you let it, a map will tell you a story. It's more than just an outline of some geography there's some names and places of cities. A map will tell you a story of people, events, places, and a time. And obviously, if you look at what this map is telling us, Vietnam 
sure it was called a conflict because of how they want to put it in the lexicon, but whatever was going on in Vietnam in the ground, there was warfare going on the ground. All those red spots are not just because somebody was you know, messed up with a red marker. Those are places where Americans and Vietnamese clashed together over the 17th parallel over a number of years. So it was full-scale warfare. And the other thing that this map tells us is that the war wasn't combined to just Vietnam. It spread into Cambodia, it spread into Laos, it threatened Thailand. So now we're talking about regional conflict here. Regional conflict that involved also the South China Sea. So now you're talking about naval warfare, land warfare, warfare that got close to China. We're talking about a warfare and a world that was different from the one that we live in today, but also very similar to the one we live in today. These are the faces of the Vietnam War. I couldn't provide commentary, but these faces are so profound. These faces are so impactful. They speak for themselves of what the Vietnam War was about and what they were going through. Let's take a moment to watch them. Peg mentioned that the Vietnam War also included some, uh, there, was, there was going to be a presentation about the Army Nurse Corps, the Nurses Corps. You know, after the Vietnam War, for one of those first times, one of those rare instances in American military history, where women had a statue actually made dedicated to women's service in Vietnam. Because Vietnam, in addition to all the other things how, about how it changed warfare, are you all aware of the fact that, you know, when we have medevacs today, or what we call med flights, a lot of that technology was developed because of medevacs in the Vietnam War, getting people from an accident to a hospital, life fighting them. So women played a very prominent role in the Vietnam War. The role of women in the military began to change from the standard nursing or non-combat type of op non-combat type of roles to more involved. If you saw the recent documentary by Ken Burns about a year or two ago on Vietnam, the one thing that people said Ken Burns did that was so good, in addition to the fact that he's just a wonderful documentarian, he showed both sides. He didn't show, he didn't show just the American soldiers, the Airmen, Marines, sailors, and Coast Guardsmen. He showed the people from the North as well. This was a more, as much a war about politicians and geo strategy, but ultimately it was about human beings, Vietnamese and Americans. Vietnam conflict had all of the usual features of warfare, the stress, the tragedy, refugees, the confusion, the anxiety, the blank faces, the death of course, the longing for peace, the spiritual vacancy, desperation, acts of heroism, The Vietnam War also showed us something that you often see in conflict, just like what happened on 9-11. The Vietnam War was because of the way it was because it was a conflict. For the soldiers in the field and for the women in the field, issues of gender and issues of race didn't matter out there in the bush. The only thing that mattered was actually watching your friends back, your fellow soldier, your fellow Marine. Because you know what, when it gets right down to it, when we give ourselves a chance, and ironically enough and tragically enough, oftentimes it happens during warfare, we find some of the best aspects of humanity when all the other window dressing is cut, cut away, and we actually have a chance to care about each other and care for each other. You find true unity out there. Believe me, I am not advocating this kind of difficulty. I'm just saying that under those conditions, people find out what really matters and they step to it and care about each other. The other thing we need to take notice of is look at how young these faces are. I told my students right now at Hope College who are what, 17, 21 years old? That when they're, if they're driving down the road or on the road someplace and see a veteran, standing there saying, you know, with a sign, 
or a veteran that's, that that needs help. I see have compassion, because once upon a time that individual was 19 years old too. They went and fought in the conflict, and maybe they had something happened to them that rattled their spirit, that shook up their mind, that hurt their body. There wasn't their plan to be standing there asking for help that day. They had dreams. They had a life to live. But their country called and they answered their call and they went and did their duty. And we owe them not just our respect, of course we owe them our respect, but we owe them the assistance and the help that they have earned. Vietnam also was a different kind of war because it was the war where the helicopter came of age. Helicopters dominated the Vietnam War. And you see this one? This was the most probably the most visible aerial vehicle during the Vietnam War, the UH-1H Huey helicopter. Air cavalry. Air I was in. What's that? That's what I was in. And anybody, anybody who's ever been in a Huey helicopter, if you hear that thing start up, you can't, you don't even need to look to know what it is. It's very distinct to start up. The wind of the engine. And then this. This is probably the most iconic photo coming out of the Vietnam War. These people on top of the CIA building at the end. Obviously not all these people are going to be able to get inside of this helicopter. And then, when it came time to say, how do we remember the people that fought in the war? It was deemed best that the best way to remember the people who fought in the war was not to build some heroic statue, it's to put up a wall with the names of the 58,000 who were lost. <coughs> and for those who lost their friends, I don't know about you all, but whenever I see this picture, this is the one that gets me up, gets me. This is the one that tears me up because here's this guy, he clearly is not 19 years old anymore, but he, there's a part of him that is still there with his friends, reaching out to him from, from beyond the grave. At, in a strange way, it was the best time of their lives because they were young, they were strong, and the worst time of their lives because they were in warfare. And that warfare took their youth, and in their cases, took their lives. The legacy of the Vietnam War, which is what we're talking about. The legacy that you saw in those faces. The legacy that Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, that he had to live with. Robert McNamara lived until he was 85 years old. And toward the end of his life, he made a documentary entitled The Fog of War, in where he spends an hour or more trying to explain the decisions that he made. How he came to turn on the Vietnam War. How he came to, to basically say that the Vietnam War wasn't winnable and what motivated him. And he eventually went to meet with some of the former leaders of North Vietnam and got into debates with them. Here he is, he's in his 80s, and he still, he still tried to litigate what happened in the Vietnam War, trying to cleanse the demons from him so he can live with himself. If you haven't seen this film, The Fall of War by Earl Morris, it's worth getting. It's truly fascinating because Robert McNamara was there at the center of the storm from the very beginning until he resigned from office. And when we're talking about the legacy, we also have to ask ourselves, what lessons did we learn from Vietnam? As it turns out, we learned a lot of lessons. Many people say we didn't learn anything. That's not true, we did learn something. For example, in the first Gulf War, the 1990s, Colin Powell, who was a company commander in the Vietnam War, company grade commander, meaning a commander of troops, who was in Vietnam in the first Gulf War, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It turned out that when we went into Iraq in the early 1990s, the one thing that he had, he had an exit strategy and a plan to get in, win, have specific objectives, and then get out. In other words, have everything that they didn't have in Vietnam. That's what he learned. So it turns out that he did learn something from Vietnam. So we learned about war. We learned about peace, too. We learned that there is a vast difference between strength and power. Just because you have strength doesn't mean that you have the power to overwhelm an enemy, especially an enemy that is determined to not be overwhelmed. But the question still persists, did we learn anything? 
I mean, really, for the long term, did we learn anything? You might look at the, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and say, well, we learned nothing. Well, is that true? We have to interrogate that. In May 2017, a colleague of mine, Dr. Scott Vanderstoop, and I, we were taking a, a group of students there just about every year, except for 2018 and 2020 because of the pandemic. But in 2017, we took some students to Ben Ben Phu. Ben Ben Phu is where the French forces were defeated by the Viet Minh in 1954. It was that turning point that some people call it the, the, the Vietnamese Waterloo. The turning point that essentially drew America into that conflict, that drew America into China, that eventually got us involved in the thing that became the Vietnam War. And even though Dan Ben Phu, as a tourist site, if you want to put it like that, is all that large, you can just look at it, even from what remains of the bunker and trench facilities that were there. The French were dug in as well as they could, but they had given the high ground to the Vietnamese. They absolutely gave away the tactical advantage if they ever had it. And I just stood there looking at those bunkers and looking at those fortifications and those trench facilities, wondering how did that battle actually take place? How long did they hold out? What was going through the mind of the French commander? They still have the crater that were made by some of the artillery explosions from the Vietnamese lobbing artillery shells on the high ground. The Vietnamese, it turned out, they used elephants, mules, and human power to, to basically cut through mountains. The, Viet, the French were so, were, were so convinced that the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese would never be able to carry four artillery pieces across those mountains. That's exactly what they did. For my students, some of them you sit there in the upper left. For them, they heard about Vietnam. They knew it was a big deal, but they didn't really understand Vietnam. Here's what we're doing tonight at the Super Size. What you all are doing by watching on Zoom or coming out here is still a very good thing because we, need to, we still need to understand this. We still need to understand how do we get involved in Vietnam? What do we do in Vietnam? What do we take from Vietnam? So the Vietnamese have preserved these areas because if you go to Vietnam today, they will tell you, quite often, as a matter of fact, we forgive you, America, but we don't forget. They will be very specific. We won the war, you didn't. We don't hold anything against you, but we are going to remember this. So they pre they're very careful to preserve the memory. We should do likewise. I think to, in order to get a real good understanding of how America gets involved in Vietnam, what happens in Vietnam after we get involved, we have to take a look at the personalities involved, obviously. And the lead character for the Vietnamese was Ho Chi Minh. I will take you back to the long history that Ho Chi Minh had. People say he was a communist, and that's true. Yes, he was a follower of Vladimir Lenin. There's a statue of Lenin in Vietnam today, one of the last few in the world. So he was a communist, but more than a communist, more than a follower of Lenin, Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist. He wanted the French, the Japanese, the Chinese, whoever it was that was a foreign power in Vietnam, he wanted them out. And as we shall see, he fought them all. Ho Chi Minh was in charge of the resistance movement during the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower. He was in charge of the resistance movement during the presidency of John F. Kennedy. He was in charge of the resistance during the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson, the American president most identified with the Vietnam conflict. He was in charge of the resistance movement during the presidency of Richard Nixon. Although Ho Chi Minh had gotten older at that point and some other people had stepped into prominence, he was still identified as a spiritual leader of that movement. All of those presidents, LBJ, Eisenhower, LBJ, Nixon, every last one of them, and I'll put up Harry Truman there in just a moment, all of them, when it came to Vietnam, they were living in the shadow of a haunting event that had happened earlier in the century, well before Vietnam became an issue for America. Five American presidents, started with Harry Truman. Harry Truman, as you all are, are, are quite aware, took over from Franklin Delano Roosevelt after he died in the spring of 1945. Harry Truman was so out of the loop as far as being informed of what was going on in the Roosevelt administration that he didn't even know about the Manhattan Project. He had to be specially briefed to know about the atomic bomb. But after FDR died, Harry Truman is a creature of his time like we all are. When I say creature of his time, that meant that he was alive 
when this individual on the right, Neville Chamberlain, had gone to Germany in the 1930s during the Sudeten crisis, and basically had gone to, had gone to Munich and came back to Britain, and a very famous statement, he got off the airplane and made a very brief speech to the British people saying, I have achieved peace in our time. He had somehow made an agreement with the Nazis, Adolf Hitler, who had promised not to ask for any more territorial claims in Europe and definitely not to go to war. And sometimes we find it hard to figure out why would he agree to such a thing. You really got to take a look at World War I to find out the devastation of what happened in, in, for humanity and then understand that humanity had never gone through anything like World War I. It was a collective shock to the human nervous system. There had never been that kind of destruction by human beings and machines of warfare. Machines designed to grind humanity into dust. That was World War I. So there were people who were desperate to not have that happen again, especially a generation later. War is in 1919, and I'll start in 1938, 1939, 1920 years later, the possibility of war breaking out again. So then with Chamberlain, we can poke him for being an appeaser, and he was. Winston Churchill eventually would say that an appeaser is someone who feeds a crocodile, hopefully it'll eat him last. That's what appeasement is. And Neville Chamberlain became identified as the appeaser of all appeasers. We say today, how could he possibly have believed someone like Adolf Hitler who was lying and was so greedy and was always aggressive and never intended to honor any of his agreements? We say that now because we know, which is why we're talking about this and teaching it. But Harry Truman lived in the shadow of that. No American president wanted to be identified as an appeaser after World War II, not standing firm against the communists. Likewise, there's Harry Truman in his artillery officer's uniform. I always, t I always tell my students, I'm so glad that by the time I got in the Marine Corps, they even got away with his uniform. So. <laughs> but Dwight Eisenhower also was alive when Neville Chamberlain came back to England and said, peace in our time. Scholars, what I'm getting at is this. After World War II, when there's the Cold War and the new bully on the block was the Soviet Union, American domestic politics, people on both sides are very, very quick to lob accusations and point fingers and saying, you're an appeaser. And for that generation, an appeaser meant Neville Chamberlain. No American politician, no American president wanted to be compared to this guy right here. And so very often, the decisions they made were not so much because of the rationality of domestic politics what was, or what was needed internationally, but as an assurance to make sure they weren't compared to him. The man that failed to recognize the threat of Adolf Hitler, and because he failed to recognize the threat of Adolf Hitler, opened the doorway, some would say, to World War II, where we lost 50 million people. No American president wants to be identified with that individual. Dwight Eisenhower, the man who became the, 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 the dominant figure at shape, Supreme Headquarters Allied European Forces, where the planning was for D-Day, June 6, 1944. Likewise, John F. Kennedy did not want to be accused of being soft on communism or soft on an international dictator. He lived in the shadow of what happened at Munich. John F. Kennedy served in the United States Navy. Right? Eisenhower, U.S. Army. Harry Truman, U.S. Army. I'm trying to draw for you another parallel here. All these presidents, in addition to having been alive at the time, whenever Chamberlain said, peace in our time, all these American presidents, to include Lyndon Johnson, all served in uniform. So they all had some skin in the game during World War II. They all had been there. Some of them had seen combat, like John F. Kennedy, people like, like Lyndon Johnson, a little bit more, not so much combat, combat arms, but still in uniform. LBJ was a Cold War, he's Cold Warrior. There's a book entitled, in. FDR Shadow by Professor William Luchtenberg. And he says, Dr. Luchtenberg says that when it came to, to, to Lyndon Bain Johnson, he was a he was an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt served for three terms, as you know, and he had a big domestic crisis called the Great Depression that many people, rightly or wrongly, credit him for resolving. And then right on the heels of the Great Depression, there was World War II, the Nazis in Europe, the Japanese in the Pacific. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt handled those masterfully. And so as a protege, and as an admirer, 
of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson decided that he would make his presidency in FDR's image. Roosevelt had the, had the Great Depression, he had the war on poverty. FDR had World War II, the Nazis and the Japanese, he had Vietnam. But it was Vietnam that would destroy his domestic program. Likewise, he served as a United States, in the United States Navy. And here he is in New Guinea. Nixon lived in the shadow of what happened in Munich. Also served in the Navy. So as we look at this, you, you can begin to see that there are some things that all these American presidents had in common. They lived in the shadow of what happened in Munich. They lived in the shadow of appeasement, particularly in Cold War, United States Cold War, East-West relations, which were hostile to say the least. They all served in the military. And having served in the military, they had some idea either directly in John F. Kennedy's case or indirectly in the case of Nixon and LBJ on the cost of what it meant to go to war. So for them, and Dwight Eisenhower especially, the cost of what it meant to go to war. So in addition to not wanting to be identified with an appeaser and having seen with their own eyes, and in Eisenhower's case, having sent hundreds of thousands of men into the jaws of danger and sometimes death, the last thing that they were inclined to want to do when it came to Vietnam, meaning the Soviet Union and Communist China, was to make the mistakes of Neville Chamberlain. It's a pretty stark image, isn't it? One, two, three, four American presidents and at the center of their concerns, not absolutely, but they all were impacted by the failure of this guy to stop a dictator. Translation, they weren't going to make the same mistakes that it caused, that it caused World War II, so they drew the line in the figure to sand, and that line for all of them was Vietnam. That explains the American presidents. But what about the leader of the Vietnamese, Ho Chi Minh? What about him? He had gone to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, where the peace negotiations were in Versailles, trying to bring some type of resolution to World War I. And you know, whenever we're talking about World War I, I always, I always make sure I mention this. It is one thing for people to say war is bad. We know that, that's why we should do it less than war. But the interesting thing about the World War I generation was that they called it the War to End All War. Do you know how unusual that is? Usually, it's not the generation that's experiencing a thing that has the insight and the wisdom to call it the thing that it eventually becomes known by. We know World War II was a pretty devastating war because of the atomic, the atomic bomb and some of the other things that happened with it, the Holocaust. But it was a rare instance like J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was a lead figure during the Manhattan Project, when he saw the first explosion of the atomic bomb, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita and said, I have become death. How did he know that at that point? In that moment when he saw that bomb explode, he knew that humanity, not him, not America, but humanity had just crossed a line into being able to fight war that could eliminate the species. And he instantly became translated from, became, quit being a nuclear scientist and became an anti-war or anti-nuclear activist. In that moment, Remember that you saw that flash in the mushroom cloud? Likewise, it is just as unusual and rare that the generation of World War I, that war was so devastating, they said, this has got to be the war to end all wars. That's how bad that thing was. They said that, not us. If we look with our long telescope and see the carnage, the death, of course we'll say that, but they said, no, we see with our own eyes what this did. We simply can't afford to do this anymore, and that was with conventional weapons. So likewise, when Ho Chi Minh goes to the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, he's there because he wants to have some conversations with the Western leaders who are talking about freedom and independence and autonomy and the right to self-determine, which is what the Vietnamese did not have. They were a colonized power, a colonized nation by the French. He never had his meeting with Woodrow Wilson, the lead figure talking about independence of nations. As he got older and matured over time, Ho Chi Minh said things like this. December 19th, 1946. The war is just over a year old, or a year ended. Our resistance will be long and painful, but whatever the sacrifices, however long the struggle, we shall fight to the end until Vietnam is fully independent and reunified. 
And then, as a warning to the French colonizers, you can kill 10 of my men for every one I kill of yours, but even at those odds, you will lose and I will win. The one thing American policymakers failed to realize early and often and frequently was that Ho Chi Minh was serious. However many of his people had to die, he was willing to see that happen until Vietnam was either destroyed or independent. Scholars, I must tell you, the last time I have been in Vietnam, twice in the last three, four years, with my students, I had the opportunity to talk to Vietnamese uh, veterans from the North Vietnamese Army, and they had told me in conversation that, yeah, Ho Chi Minh was serious. They were prepared to fight until every last one of them was gone, or until they had won that war. Now, of course, it was a war of attrition, but and in the one case, it was a terrible thing for them to have to live with, but it came down to how many of your people can you lose before you leave our country, before we end up dying to the point where just we're not here anymore. It was really, really that kind of mortal conflict. Reminds one of Stalingrad. And then there was this. It is better to sacrifice everything than to live in slavery. This is Ho Chi Minh. This is his mindset. If you've been in the military, you know that the one thing, how do you fight someone who already says that death doesn't matter to them? What do you scare them with? Usually soldiers, people are motivated to stay alive. But he's not worried about that. For him, independence of Vietnam, no foreign power to include the United States was his objective. So you have Ho Chi Minh as a, as a, as a major character here. American president is living in the shadow of, of Neville Chamberlain, as I've already mentioned. And this, of course, is him shaking hands with Hitler and failing the world at that point. Now, we're talking legacy. Who are these people? What's the context? Chronologically, the Vietnam conflict, you might say, sort of begins right toward the end of World War II. You have the tyrants, Hideki Tojo, who the, the military leader of Japan, and of course, Adolf Hitler, leader of Nazi Germany, and Benito Mussolini, the leader of fascist Italy. So the war begins in 1939. For the Americans, of course, it started on December 7, 1941. And then D-Day, June 6, 1944, the invasion of Normandy was a, one of those major inflection points where you could tell that the, the fortunes for the Nazis and their allies were turning sour to indeed. The American Pacific War started, and the American Pacific War ended pretty much with the two atomic bombings on August 6, 1945, when we dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and then three days later on Nagasaki. September 2nd, 1945, the surrender document was signed aboard the USS Missouri. The Pacific War was over. As far as the Pacific War in Vietnam were concerned, or what they called French Indochina at the time, bear with me as I read. September 1940, Japan invaded French Indochina. The country was occupied with little resistance. When you figure like this, the Japanese invaded, and the Japanese went into World War II saying that they wanted Asia for the Asians. What they meant was they wanted Asia for the Japanese. <coughs> May 1941, Ho Chi Minh and his communists established the League for Independence of Vietnam. This group became known as the Viet Minh. They resisted the French and Japanese occupation. So for them, Japanese, French, Chinese, because they fought because the, the Vietnamese fought the Chinese a number of times in the history too. They to them it didn't matter. They wanted their country free of foreign invaders. March 1945, the war is ending, last year of the war. Japanese troops carry out a coup against French authorities and announce an end to, to the colonial area, declaring Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia independent. We should take note of the fact that the Japanese are including Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam all in the same sentence. So they are, geographically, they're seeing this as all part of one package, which is very interesting coming from them. <coughs> then, August, Japan is defeated by the Allies, surrenders on September 2nd, France begins to reassert its authority. Can you imagine, look, if you're a Vietnamese person in 1945, you just spent four or five years being, being harassed and brutalized by the Japanese. And now the war, the dust is not settled, the smoke is not really cleared, and the French are coming back to research their colonial authority, which is goes to show that when you ask the question, of, did we learn anything? Clearly the French, when it came to colonization, learned nothing from World War II. Here you see a picture of Ho Chi Minh and this individual right here towering above them, Major Alassane Thomas. 
Now, during World War II, the American OSS, Office, Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, oftentimes worked with the Vietnamese, meaning Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh, to carry out operations against the Japanese. So Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh were our allies during World War II. Now we know time passes, things change, relationships will shift. But we were not always enemies with Ho Chi Minh. There was an intersection there, not only relative to the war, but also philosophically. This is the part that rolled my socks down when I found out about this. Ho Chi Minh, as it turns out, was a fan of American Republican style democracy. In fact, he was a fan and a student and a quite, and a quite well-informed student of how America, the nation, came to be. And for his own nation, he took our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. He used that document to draft his own on September 2nd, 1945. Now September 1945 is the year that the Japanese surrender to the Americans and the Allies aboard the USS Missouri. In that same month, Ho Chi Minh, using our Declaration of Independence as his template, as his blueprint, he says, all men are created equal. They are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If Ho Chi Minh were in my class, I'd have to fade him for plagiarism. Because he uses a good portion of our Declaration of Independence. He saw the American model of independence and government as something he wanted to emulate. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the U.S. in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have a right to live, to be happy, and free. The Declaration of the French Revolution made in 1791 on the rights of man and citizen also states all men are born free and with equal rights and must always remain free and have equal rights. Those are undeniable truths. He's quoting that from the French Revolution because after all, France being a colonizer of Vietnam, he's saying your own words are something you're not living up to. So the American Declaration of Independence and the document that the French used to gain their own independence or get rid of the king in 1793 when they chopped off Louis XVI's head, those were his inspirations. So he may have been a communist. Yes, he was a communist. But he's also a fan of American style democracy. How did things go wrong? The French wanted to modify Ho Chi Minh by offering him some form of limited rule. He said no to that. And then there was another opportunity to establish friendly relations with the Vietnamese that also failed. It was in a conversation that he had with Major, Major Alassane Thomas, where Ho Chi Minh said, Major, Major Thomas said to Ho Chi Minh, are you a communist? In September 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is dead. It's helpful for, for us to understand that in his cabinet, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had people in his cabinet that some historians are called cold warrior, cold warriors. They really did not like the Russians, did not really trust the Russians did not like the Russians. And already, the lines are starting to set hard and fast for the post-war world. So Major Thomas says to Ho Chi Minh, are you a communist? Ho Chi Minh says, yes, but we can still be friends, can't we? Evidently, no. And the Cold War was on. We know the Cold War was on, that it was a a hard fought contest because it lasted, what, 45, 50 years. The Cold War is exemplified, symbolized by the fact that Germany, the big combatant in Europe during World War was, was divided between East and West, and then the Western part divided up between the Americans, the French, and the British. On the Soviet side, it was dominated by the Russians with Berlin divided up similarly into East and West between America, France, and Britain, and the Russians dominating the other side. We know the Cold War was on because in the late 1940s, 1947, 1948, the Russians cut off land access to the western part of Berlin, necessitating an airlift called the Berlin Airlift that lasted for a whole year. 
It was a public relations disaster for the Russians, and it put the Russia on display, showing the world just exactly what lengths they were willing to go through to starve out women and children and men who had been already beaten and bludgeoned by war. Now they were going to starve them to death. It didn't look good for the Russians. And then there was the encroachment by the Soviet army in Eastern Europe. One of my professors in one of my teachers in high school said that every mile that the Red, that the Red Army traveled during World War II, they, every mile they went, that's where they stayed when the war ended. And they did. There was also independence movements going on around the world. There was so much going on happening that the Western powers simply could not wrap their mind around. Independence movements in Africa, independence movements in Asia. The old style of colonialism, World War II had done away with that. Europe and France were too exhausted at the two world wars to hang on to their colonies and they couldn't do it anymore. And people on the African continent demanded independence and they were going to get it. And people in Asia were going to get it as well. And that also meant in Vietnam. And then there was this other thing that happened too. In early 1946, Winston Churchill came to Fulton, Missouri and gave a speech in which he said, an iron curtain has been drawn across Europe. It's an iron curtain made of tanks and artillery pieces. This map symbolizes that Iron Curtain. Europe was being divided between East and West. And listen, the policymakers back then, they weren't wrong. The Russians were not fuzzy teddy bears. They were a force to be threatened. They, they were a force that definitely exhibited threat. And then this happened. Just in case there was any doubt that the Cold War was a global conflict and that people could be not only threatened but lives would be lost. On June 25th, 1950, North Korea, backed by Russia and Communist China, attacked South Korea. Now, I forgot to mention that in 1949, several things happened. Two things happened significantly. In 1949, the Russians exploded their first atomic device, which meant that the American monopoly on nuclear war ended like that. We had it for what, three and a half, four years, and it was gone. And it did not help that we knew even then that the Russians, that their accelerated nuclear program had been gotten because of what spying activity. That further heightened the distrust between the two nations. And then in 1949, Mao Zedong and his communists kicked the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek off of mainland China onto foremost that today we call it Taiwan. Now, mainland China, one of the biggest nations in all of Asia, is communist, Russia's communist. If you look at a map, a significant part of the world is red and under the hammer and sickle. It's not looking good geographically. It just isn't. And then with the North Koreans attacking, America can't use its full military power against the Russians because they have a nuclear device as well now. And for three years, from 1950 to 1953, we found ourselves fighting a conflict in Korea that ended up in a stalemate. You all are smart enough to know that we're still technically in a state of war with Korea because we, in 1953, we signed a ceasefire with them and a ceasefire is exactly what it says. I agree to not shoot at you, I agree to not shoot at you if you agree to not shoot at me. That is not a peace treaty. A peace treaty means what it says. We won't shoot at each other. So for the last 50 or, year, 50 or so years, or 60 or so years, we've been have this tenuous existence with with, with Korea, with North Korea. And then there was this. During this period of the 1950s and the early Cold War, a thing called the domino theory. It was believed that a Korea fell, then they might go to the Philippines. And this also was not a major area because I spent my childhood in the Philippines. There's a group of, there's a group of people in the Philippines called the Huck Balahap. They're communist insurgents. They're alive and well today. They were threatening the, they were threatening the government in Manila. So the theory was that China already fell, North Korea already fell, and North Korea's already threatened South Korea. If North Korea can threaten South Korea, then eventually go to Vietnam, then Thailand, then Laos, then Burma. China's already gone, then the Philippines, the rest of Malaysia, Indonesia. And if you looked at, if you looked at a map of Europe, it was already looking dire. And it looked like communism was on the move. So try to imagine this for a moment. Let's take a, let's take a pause for a moment. American presidents during that period who lived with the memory of Neville Chamberlain and their own military experiences of men and women dying in Europe and in the Pacific. And now this is happening again. 
They've just finished one world war against the Nazis, the fascists, and the militarists in Japan. And now this is the world that they live in. We don't have to agree with their decisions. And Lord knows they made a lot of wrong decisions. But when you understand the context of the world they lived in, their decisions become a lot more understandable. I hope. And then this. In 1959, Fidel Castro, who led a rebellion against a man named Fulgencio Batista in Cuba, came to the United States on a, a charm tour. He bamboozled the American people and American leaders to supporting him and overthrowing Batista. And he did. He succeeded. And then he turned around and embraced the Russians. Now we have the Soviet Union 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And for an American leader of that, that day and time, that was, that, that was a, a step just too close, obviously. And likewise, as I mentioned, Kwame Nkrumah became the first, the first leader of an independent Ghana. And there were a lot of worries about communism also infiltrating the African continent. In fact, I should have a picture up here. I, I, didn't, I don't have it in here, but I should have a picture of Patrice Lumumba, who was eventually assassinated because he wanted his nation to be independent. He came to the West asking for assistance to get rid of the Belgians. The West told him no. So then he turned and went to the East, meaning the Russians, to ask them. He, like Ho Chi Minh, wanted his nation free of foreign foreign involvement. But because he turned to the Russians, he was labeled a communist, and he was executed and assassinated. Which takes us back to Vietnam. In that world, Ho Chi Minh, in a world where communism is on the march, you now have Ho Chi Minh, who wants the French, an American ally, out of Vietnam. And then came 1954, Dien Bien Phu, Waterloo of Southeast Asia. There was a picture there. But this French newspaper, you can see, Dien Bien Phu is a tomb. It is a tomb, a graveyard. And I must tell you that when I was there, it still had the feeling of a tomb, a graveyard. All battlefields have, a, have an air of sad sacredness about them, but this just had a sadness to it. Defeat, trauma, more than 70 years later. You can see even today that the high ground that the French surrendered to the to, to Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh, the high ground that they, the, the, the Vietnamese lobbed their artillery rounds casually. French, the French had superior air power, in fact they had air supremacy. But they still was not enough to keep the defeat from coming. And then this happened. By August 5th, 1964, America, in this case, John F. Kennedy's been dead for about just over a year now. Or right around a year, because he's, he's assassinated on November 22nd, 1963. Lyndon Johnson assumes office hours after the president has been killed. And now it's 1964. And LBJ, who again, according to Professor Luchtenberg, is going to, he's going to protect the world from communism the same way the FDR helped to defeat fascism and militarism. And on August 5th, 1964, something happened in the Gulf of Tonkin where allegedly an American destroyer was attacked by elements of the Vietnamese Navy. And two days later, Congress passed something called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing the president to take any measures he believed were necessary to retaliate and to promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. We asked a question at the outset, did we learn anything? One thing we have learned something from, come, sort of, because after 9-11, but not just 9-11, we have seen this happen with other administrations. We have seen, we have all too often been too quick to give presidents the power to take us into war without a declaration of war. And in this, if you read this, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, here's the operative phrase right here. Authorizing the president to take any measures he believed were necessary to retaliate and promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. 
Well, what does that mean? To take any measures he believed were necessary. Does that mean a little bit? A lot? What kind? How many troops? What kind of weapons? Air power? Bombing? Rolling thunder? B-52s? Aircraft carriers deployed to the area? Because they all were used. Marines? Army? Navy? Coast Guard? They all went there. How many do you build up? Before it's all over with, there'll be a half million men in Dene, just in Dene. There'll be alerts, long-range reconnaissance patrols. There'll be swift boats along the Mekong River. At what point does this, does this all measures that he believes become, is there a stop point to it? Is there an end point? Remember what I said about Colin Powell? He said, we want, we want to have a specific plan to go into Iraq, specific objective. We're going to use all our firepower to secure that objective. And then once we secure the objective, we have a timetable for getting out. This does not give any indication of that. Did we learn anything? Yes, we learned something. But have we remembered it to the degree that we should? For places like Afghanistan, did we remember? How do we end up being there for 20 years? Vietnam still has much to teach us. Would you agree? You're not nodding your head, but I know you agree. <laughs> This, is, this resolution became the legal basis for the Johnson and Nixon administrations. And as you got, you all are clever enough, you'll remember enough, that it was the Nixon administration that expanded the Vietnam War into Laos and Cambodia. They called it the secret war. Imagine, you remember how you felt, what you were thinking when you, when you first found out that the war had expanded from Vietnam to Cambodia and to Laos? It destabilized Cambodia was part of the Khmer Rouge coming to power after the Vietnam War ended, after he pulled out of the region. When the Khmer Rouge came to power, is what led to Pol Pot being able to get in charge. And two million Cambodians have lost their lives in what were called the killing fields. It destabilized Southeast Asia for more than a generation. And the wounds are still there. Philip Caputo, who was a Marine Corps lieutenant in the Vietnam War, if you ever read his book, I really, I really urge you to read his book, A Rumor of War. After he got out of the Marine Corps, he became a very, very well-known journalist. But in A Rumor of War, he tells you early on that for his generation growing up, the generation after World War II, he was too young to go to World War II, but he wanted to be like John Wayne and Sands of Iwo Jima. His uncle, his dad, his, his elders had done their part to keep the world safe for democracy. Now it was their turn. So he actually looked forward to going to war and doing his part for the country. But he said, from an excerpt, he says, the heroic experience I saw was war. War, the ultimate adventure. War, the ordinary man's most convenient means of escaping the ordinary. The country was at peace then, but the early 60s were years of almost constant tension and crisis. If a conflict did break out, the Marines would be certain to fight in it, and I could be there with them, actually there, not watching it on a movie or TV screen, not reading about it in a book, but there living out of fantasy. Already I saw myself charging up some distant beachhead like John Wayne and Sands of Iwo Jima. And then coming home, a suntanned warrior with medals on my chest. If, you have, if you've never seen Sands of Iwo Jima, it's worth taking a look at. It's a fun movie, but it is definitely romanticizing World War. <laughs> I mean, what can you say about a guy that says, I want to go to war to get a suntan? <laughs> A man, Caputo goes on to say, a man needs many things in war, but a strong imagination is not one of them. He says, in Vietnam, the best soldiers were usually unimaginative men who did not feel afraid until there was obvious reason. But the rest of us suffer from constant expectancy, feeling that something was about to happen, waiting for it to happen, wishing it would happen, just so the tension would be relieved. For those of, those, those of you who have been in the military, I know you've heard the phrase, hurry up and wait. It's a standard military reality. You stand around waiting for something to happen, and then there's hours and hours of boredom, then something happens, and it's an intense moment of an adrenaline rush that can't be matched. There's another book that I would recommend to you. It's called Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam. Very, very poignant, touching letters that get to the heart of what the Vietnam War was, was for the individual woman and man on the ground in Vietnam. One, for example, Private First Class Richard E. Marks wrote on December 12, 1965. Now the troop buildup is still going on. Rolling Thunder is still going on. I mean, the round-the-clock bombing campaign ordered by President Johnson. 
He wrote home to his mother, Dear Mom, I am writing this in the event that I am killed during my remaining tour of duty in Vietnam. First of all, I want to say that I'm here as a result of my own desire. I'm here because I always wanted to be a Marine and because I, I always wanted to see combat. I don't like being over here, but I am doing a job that must be done. This was the generation of the 1960s. These young people that came out of the Korean conflict or they grew up during the Korean conflict and heard about World War II, they were sincere about doing their duty for America. They didn't, they didn't need to be coached, not yet. The age of war movement has not started, it has not gained momentum yet. So there's still a belief that we're fighting a good fight against communism. And again, it was good to fight communism because communism was and is a threat. The question though was, were we fighting it the right way? I am fighting an inevitable enemy that must be fought, now or later. Do you hear that, that's it, there's an echo of World War II there. You don't negotiate with Nazis. You can't, you can't mess around halfway with Japanese militarists. You can't sit up and bargain with you know, Italian fascists. This is an all them or us, do or die proposition. So they're, st they're still thinking with the mindset of World War II, but this is a different day and time. It's a different war, it's a limited war. I am fighting to protect and maintain what I believe in and what I want to live in, a democratic society. If I'm killed by carrying out this mission, I want no one to cry or mourn for me. I want people to hold their heads high and be proud of me for the job I did. There are a number that I had to choose from, but I chose this one because I think Private Marx, POC Marx, sums up the enthusiasm and the optimism of American youth at that time in uniform went to Vietnam, the believers. And I don't mean true believers. Now, I'm not talking about people who are ignorant, blind true believers. Clearly this is a young man of thought. He believes in something. He believes in his country. He believes in democracy. And he wants to do his part like his elders did. But the question was, were his elders doing justice to him? Did he understand that Ho Chi Minh was prepared to lose as many people as he needed in order to win this war? Because that's exactly what it came down to. And toward the end of Vietnam, the Time Magazine covers told the story, didn't it? April 14, 1975, collapse in Vietnam. April 21st, 1975, a week later, last exit from Vietnam. And now and another American president, Gerald Ford, is overseeing the conflict in Vietnam. Now it's gone from five presidents to six. May 5th, 1975, Hanoi's triumph. The period where those, those two Vietnamese tanks crashed through the Imperial Palace, or the palace of the government in South Vietnam. We had taken students into that palace, into that, that building in 2019. It, it serves now, it doubles now as a museum, complete piece, but also serves as a functioning government building. And the two tanks that crashed through those, those gates are there now as museum pieces. It's, it's surreal to go there and see those actual tanks sitting there and still have the memory of them going through that, those gates and tearing them down, just running, just running them over. The May 12, 1975, the victor, Ho Chi Minh. And Americans come home, our American women and men come home to either a hostile greeting or a silent greeting. John F. Kennedy, I believe, said that victory is the, has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Nobody wanted to talk about Vietnam for a long, long time. Nobody wanted to talk to the people that fought in Vietnam. Look, they were just young kids who answered the call and did their duty. It wasn't their fault. There was a draft going on. None of them really wanted to go. Maybe some were happy to go to do their duty. Some ran away. They thought that was the best way of expressing their patriotism. But it was a complicated situation. But the reception that we gave our women and men coming back from Vietnam was, to put it in a word, shameful. So I tell my students all the time that, you know, for them, saying thank you for your service, it's a cultural thing they grew up with. That's what everybody says right now because everybody says it. But then I tell them, you gotta understand, once upon a time, not so long ago, that was not the case. That changed in the first Gulf War when we had victory and everybody wanted to claim victory against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Then people began taking a look at Vietnam, how we welcomed those soldiers back, and then start to reflect on how we did not 
welcome our Vietnam veterans back. Then they said, we need to correct this. And we're still working on correcting it. We need to do a better job, in my opinion. So we have the legacy of Vietnam, the lessons that we'll learn, but we also have to deal with the losses of Vietnam. The losses. 58,000 that we know of and those who are still wounded in spirit, in mind, and body. We still need to care after them. Because as you all are aware, it's the wounds you can't see that last the longest and that sometimes go the deepest. <coughs> this is our America. We defend the country. Sometimes not in the best way, but we defend it always. Vietnam was one of those moments, which I heard somebody once say, well, when it comes to Vietnam, there'll be plenty of time to think about it, now that we're out of it. And we continue to think about it. It still has the capability of teaching us lessons. Thank you for allowing me to, take, to share some thoughts with you. like to unmute themselves and ask a question we'll be very happy to answer as well as our any of our guests in the room um, we'll start with yes go ahead yeah there are a few things that were left out that Ho Chi Minh was forcing communism on the south you remember after the country was divided mm -hmm. there were people flocked from the north to the south because of kind they didn't want to be under communism that's correct and uh, he was forcing communism It'd be the same with, if, should we stay out now? If North Korea attacks South Korea again, should we stay out of that mess? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and just let them, you know how the people on the North live, let the communists come down and treat them. Right. I know people who have got relatives in South Vietnam right now, well, Vietnam, who hate, the, hate communism. Well, should we just sit by and let, let stuff like that happen? Uh, um, Ho Chi Minh wasn't. He did all these things that you said, but he wasn't the great person that you're kind of making him out to be. That was not that's not my attempt. Listen, well, this way it sounded to me. Let me let me let me say this very clearly. Ho Chi Minh, because he had he was so single-minded in his purpose to make Vietnam an independent country, he was not above using whatever form of ruthlessness he had to apply you're to exactly achieve that. Right. End. You're exactly right. See, we had a we had an interpreter that mm -hmm. traveled through the jungles with us. And I had a chance to sit down and talk to him. No, he had a cousin fight for the Viet Cong. And he explained to me the reason. Same reason he said here. Because they've been ruled by the Japanese, been ruled by the French. Mm -hmm. They want to be ruled by their self. Right. But they were against communism. Yes. Now, he, he, even his cousin was. But he would fight for the Viet Cong to, to have self-rule. Vietnamese rule. But he said he fought with Americans because he didn't want no part of communism. Mm -hmm. So the country was divided on, uh, on all this, um, and now when, should we just let any country in the world who is communist just take over another country and um, not help them, not uh, support them, not, uh, I mean, uh, I don't understand people's thinking on that, uh, just like World War II. Yeah, some people wouldn't have went to war in World War II for nothing. Right, right. Uh, and yet, if we wouldn't have went to World War II, we'd either speak, be speaking Rus Russian or some other uh, country, right, or some other language right now. Let me offer this. In 1947, during the Greek crisis, okay, Harry Truman is still president, right? And during the Greek crisis, Harry Truman comes out with a, with a, policy, state, a policy statement that's known <laughs> as the Truman Doctrine, and it basically just turns American foreign policy on its head. Now, American presidents since George, George Washington has said, essentially, not, not every last one of them, but American presidents have been pretty much of the same mindset that we will go to war only if America itself is directly threatened. Japan, Pearl Harbor, easy case, right? But Harry Truman comes along and says, well, wait a minute. It's the Cold War. Greece is being overrun by these communists. The British have pulled out. And it looks like Greece is about to be overrun. Communism is spreading through Europe. The Greek government, the, Greek, the, the Greeks who wanted to have democracy were the ones who were fighting for communism appeal to the United States. And so Harry Truman said that 
our country, the United States, will provide military, political, and economic assistance to any nation around the world that is fighting to maintain itself against communist aggression. Now, what does that mean for American foreign policy? Because in this instance, America, the nation literally is not being attacked. But we did not just say that we will provide, we will extend our, our assistance to any nation around the world that's being threatened by this. So what it did was, it took American foreign policy and it expanded it and get it to your question about, you know, what do we do in these different situations? Well, every situation was different. Greece is now Southeast Asia, right? But if we're gonna sit up, and, if we're gonna sit up and, and give our assistance, political, economic, and especially military to anybody that's fighting a communist insurgency, then we're committed to that. And what eventually happens in the United States is that people begin asking this, how is this actually affecting us directly? I get your point that you're saying you fight them there, and you fight them in Korea? Well, it, w it would have, uh, yeah. uh, because from things that I've read mm -hmm. about the North Vietnamese government, the reason they didn't go into uh, Cambodia, because we had drained them dry. They didn't have no more resources to go into Cambodia. They had intentions to mm -hmm. turn it all over. Well, we had ties in Cambodia. We yeah. had ties in, in the Philippines, which they would have, if they could have took Cambodia, Philippines might might have been next. We had ties in the Philippines. That was a belief, yes. And so the and and, and another reason is that uh, to me, I thought if I lived in a free country and we were being invaded by a com communist country, would I want the greatest country in the world, the United States, to come in and help? Sure, I would. Mm -hmm. And that's it, it, and that's a form of why. To me, that we we went, we had ties, we had ties, we had ties. We were asked to help, uh, and uh, we helped. Uh, uh, um, whether it was right or wrong, you know, you can come up with all kinds of statistics later mm -hmm. and said this and that, and this president did this, and this president did this. But uh, there comes a time where we, you know, I, I like you would put this the soldier's letter up there. Mm -hmm. I heard once. The only thing worse than war is afraid to go to war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, if we sit back and say, well, that's no good for us. We don't want to get in that war. Well, we don't want to. Well, the Russians have got so many troops in, in Cuba. We don't want to go to that war. Let them, let them uh, you know, uh, pretty soon in California, we say, well, well, they're already in California, but we're on the East Coast. They're too far from us. Let it, let it go. Don't go to war. We don't want to go to war with them right now. You know, we, we don't want a country like that either. Well, that's part, of the, that's part of the benefit of having a discussion about Vietnam, because now we're talking about when we go to war, what are we going to war for? Are we being directly threatened? Is there another one of those extraterritorial things that may come here? Was because certainly since Vietnam, we've seen that warfare will come to our shores. Right? So the question is, do you fight them there? Like President Bush said, we can fight them over there, we can fight them right here. Well, I want to fight them over there. Most, people, yeah. most people would say that. But it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing to noodle on and to, and to have a debate about. So the issue was, you're right, Ho Chi Minh was not above and certainly did apply ruthlessness. And there were South Vietnamese, Vietnamese people that absolutely did not want to live under Ho Chi Minh's brand of communism. Right. At the same time, there were those in the South Vietnamese government who are pretty bad actors, who You're are right. just as bad. You're right. And so they ended up hating both of us. The, yeah. the, the American government that enabled their own leaders to oppress them as well. So another thing that, that, that the United States did not come to realize soon enough, Ho Chi Minh's ruthless and notwithstanding, was that what we were actually in the middle of was a civil war, among other things, between the North and the South. And the civil war, which is why we had to admire the, the, the French and the British, the, the British especially, if we're not getting involved in ours, a civil war is like a family fight. You can get involved, but you're really risking a lot for yourself, because usually they'll find a way of getting along with each other. Well, you're right, and then, but then again, we're, we're talking about two different ways of life. Mm -hmm. um, everybody knows what North Korea is like. I mean, you see it all the time. Um, if they invade the South again, as old as I am, 76 year old, I'm ready to go again. If not that I like war and I'm afraid of I war, understand that. but 
what country would want to live like the way the North Koreans live? Um, and in Vietnam now, you probably see the good side of Vietnam now, but you don't get up and talk to the farmers who who uh, probably, I would say, and I shouldn't say that because I don't know. I have been, I have been to but, the rural areas of Vietnam. Viet Vietnam, Vietnam for what, it, for what it went through, for the many years of warfare, it has done an amazing bounce back. It looks like a smaller version of China. You know, because you, you look, it's a communist country to be sure. But look, you know that if you, if you want to find out who won the war, they won, they won on the battlefield. But when you fly into Hanoi and you're driving down the street in a taxi and you see a Kentucky Fried Chicken, well, we may not have won, but KFC's doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, and that's again, it, that's and it. And again, I still, I still, one of those that say we didn't lose the war, we pulled out of the war. We would have stayed. I mean, we'd still be losing men, but they wouldn't have control of the South. We would have stayed. Um, still yet. Should we have stayed? No. But uh, uh, we didn't lose that war. I mean, our government tried to help us lose the war, but we we pulled out of the war. We just pulled troops out and left. And uh, same as they did over in that war wasn't won by the Taliban over it's, there. It's, it's interesting, they pulled out. It's interesting that you mention that because when we take the students over there, there's a, uh, we take them to uh, to one of the areas where the where, where they had the, the, the tunnels. The Kuchi. Kuchi. Yeah, we take them to Kuchi. And the tunnels now, it's very interesting because the, the Vietnamese guys that, that, that go through there, the last one that I talked to, he said, well, I, I can never get, get in one of these tunnels today. I said, why is he something too fat? Yeah. During the war, they, you know, they, had, they had very sparse diets. They were shorter, they were slimmer, and they, they, they could get into the tunnels. But he said that, but before, before you can go into the tunnel, you had, I mean, literally, if you're a Westerner, or even a Vietnamese citizen from the South, you had to sit through this, this, grainy, this grainy film that sounded like something out of Dr. Strangelove it looks like it was produced by the worst Russian director ever. <laughs> it's propaganda, you know, propaganda overblown or whatnot about, and they're calling us the invader and the, the colonizer, blah, blah, blah. So clearly the Vietnamese, all that just to say the Vietnamese have a different narrative of it, their government does. Yes. Right? But They do. And so that's why I found it prudent to talk to those North Vietnamese veterans who said they had a lot of respect for the American, the, the, the American Service servicemen fighting on the ground, and they were glad that the war ended. Well, they were nice people. Hmm? Vietnamese are nice people, um, but I can tell you what, and they probably—I don't know if they forced you to go through uh, through a male eye or not, but they usually force uh, uh, visitors. That we actually over visited. We actually eye. visited a survivor of my eye. Well, they did more atrocities on their own people than uh, we ever thought about doing uh, in villages that wouldn't let them have their rice or wouldn't let them store weapons. They would destroy the village or kill mm -hmm. the leader of the village. I mean, and it's their own people. But, oh yeah, we're coming down to do good, but we're going to kill you if you don't agree with us on anything. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, uh, I guess there's two, two sides to every story, but uh, uh, yeah, they, they they did a lot of atrocities. Yes, you know, the Vietnamese yes. army did, and yes. the Viet Cong did also. Yes, when we've had the students over there, we have taken them to a, 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 a site where the children, what this, the most recent generation of children who are suffering from Agent Orange, just have cognitive and physical uh, maladies and whatnot that they're dealing with. We have visited My Lai. We talked to a survivor who saw his mother slaughtered that morning, yes. and he treated us like you know. I mean, it was just the, the way this guy treated us was just a, a, a testament to, to graciousness and, and being able to f forgive that, that kind of a thing. And, you know, just like you and I are talking right now, my students who, don't, who are not, a, who are clear are not as aware of what happened as you are, they're trying to figure out, well, why were we there? And when I tell them well, we had to be there, you know, giving them some of the same information I share with you all, they just go like, but it doesn't make sense that they didn't want us there. But you, and I say, you don't understand. This was a, you know, this generation coming out of World War II, they, they were operating on what they knew. And what they knew is that they had fought a four-year war where the world, where, where to, to borrow Winston Churchill's phrasing, or to paraphrase him, the last of Western civilization and Christianity almost went out. 
So it wasn't some type of a imaginary situation where there were, you know, and I, I try to make the point that, you know, even though during the time at the end of World War II, people were referring to Joseph Stalin as Uncle Joe, he was not some fuzzy, marshmallowy yeah. guy. He was a ruthless killer. He was shown it with his own people. And just as you point out, when the North Koreans attacked South Korea in 1950, the fact that the Russians and the Chinese were behind him says a whole lot. So when you get caught up in all of what was going on, the bad actors in South Vietnam, the fact that Ho Chi Minh was willing to do whatever it took to win the war, I guess the best that can be said it was just a bad time all over the place. And maybe you couldn't have made a right decision. Now, are you aware, I, I just heard it maybe a few months back, but, uh, and I don't know how true it is, there's a lot of reports come out, but I had heard that uh, North Vietnamese government, if we would have kept the bombing up, they said, that they were ready to pull their troops back home. Well. If, but we stopped the bombing. You're talking about the Christmas bombing in 1972? Well, the, yeah, the, the, the uh, what do they call that? Uh, Rolling Operation Rolling. Linebacker 1 and 2. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they said they were being hurt so bad in the north that they couldn't take much more of it. Uh, now, would they have come back at a later time? I'm sure they would. Uh, but uh, the others reports now that the leaders say they were ready to pull troops back home. And uh, Washington, many of the Nixon administration was getting a lot of pressure from around the world to stop the bombing. Even people inside of his own administration said that it looked like Nixon was having a, a temper tantrum with B-52s. Uh, the guy who's the guy who's our on the con on the ground contact in in Vietnam. He's, he's one of the highest ranking UN officials inside the country. His parents sent him to Russia during that time so that he, would, so that he wouldn't be hurt by the bombing. And many people would agree with you because you know, they say that even during that time, the, the reason why Nixon started the bombing in December in, in the, the latter part of 1972 is because the Vietnamese had got up from the negotiating table in Paris and walked out. Then there was a bombing that brought them back. So if you, if, you, if you sit up and look at you know, responses to cause effect, it appears that the bombing brought them back. Well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But it definitely tore up both sections of Vietnam that are still being rebuilt after all this time. Now, could the bombing have actually done something about making them pull their troops back you know, in the field? Don't know. We don't. Don't know. But we do know that the bombing, they got up and left the negotiating table, the bombing, the bombing happened, then they came back. Now, did, did the bombing bring them back? We don't know, but again, cause effect, that happened, they came back, that's a fact. Yes? After that initial bombing, though, the linebacker one and two, it took them three years plus a little bit to uh, actually conquer South Vietnam. So it must have really set them back militarily because they took out uh, petroleum products for, for transportation, they took mm -hmm. out tons of weapons, and uh, I don't know how many people it actually killed, but it was more military supply type stuff that it, mm -hmm. it, it cut off from them. It took them a long time to recover before they could take over. And, pu and plus part of the American strategy, you know, from the carrier-based airstrikes and the land-based airstrikes coming out of either uh, Thompson or, you know, from as far away as Guam, you know, was to take out Vietnamese infrastructure, roads, bridges and whatnot. That's why they, in part, why they expanded the war to Cambodia because they were going into Cambodia to move supplies. And the Cambodian government, the, the, at the time, was what, Prince Sihanouk? Prince Sihanouk just wasn't strong enough to keep the Vietnamese from, from coming into his country. So yeah, he was eventually deposed, and they, they lost their monarchy, but yeah. You, you all are clearly very well informed. It's, it's great to have this back and forth with you. Thank you for those of you that- Thank you. <laughs> thank for you. those of you that served in Vietnam, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you to Fred for giving us such an insightful, and you know what? I think the biggest part of any one of these lectures is the discussions that we have afterwards. And I'm thrilled to see that we're doing that because that is where the true understanding, the true, where we're sharing ideas and sharing information and conversing. And so I'm thrilled that we're doing that. Next week, please, if you know any Army vets that served during Vietnam, please send them for our next lecture. And um, we're hoping to have a big crowd that way, both on Zoom as well as in person. And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And I look forward to seeing you and everyone else next week. Thank you all. Great seeing you. Thank you.